Let us pray. Now, Father God, I ask this morning that you would guide each of us into your will. Now, Father, we know that each of us living our lives have many choices to make. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we make those choices, that we would not choose the ways of the flesh, but that we would choose the ways of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would guide and lead us where you would take us that we would not resist your will, that as opportunities arise this day, even in the week to come, to serve you, to share Christ, to love others, to praise you, that we would take those opportunities, that we would be aware of those opportunities and see the world around us with just a bit of the eyes that you see the world, that we might come to have an understanding of what you would have for us. Lord, we pray that you truly would be our vision this morning. Father, give us opportunities this day and the week to come to worship you through conflict, to worship you through our struggles, to worship you through hard times, that as we do so, we might be refined, that as we do that, we might become more like Christ who suffered for us. Father, we are thankful for this. We praise uh, you in this way. We ask these things in his precious name. Amen. And for the scripture reading this morning, we turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27 this morning. And we'll read the whole uh, song of David here together. Psalm 27. Of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this beautiful song of David that for so long was saying aloud we thank you that it's preserved today that we might read it that we may not know the melody but what we do know is the heart we do know the words here of david we do know that he was carried along by the holy spirit and in this psalm we find so much for us today we see a call to worship we see a call to recognize your greatness as the sovereign lord We see a call to seek after you. And so, Lord, I pray that each person here, each person listening to this message later, that they would truly seek after your heart. 
that they would have a desire to know you. And Father, in knowing you, in seeking you, I pray that as enemies surround them, be they other people, be they the situations and circumstances of life, or perhaps their own flesh that assails them. Father, I pray that as our enemies surround us, we would take refuge and shelter in you. That you would be our rock, that you would be our foundation, that we would be unshaken, not in our own strength, but in your strength, Lord. Father, we pray this for those who are sick, those who are suffering this morning. We pray this, in terms of thankfulness and praise, as we think of Bruce, uh, Rob's brother, uh, who had his heart uh, procedure this week and seems to be doing very well and has said he feels better than he has in a very long time. And Lord, we, uh, we praise you for the wisdom that you've given the doctors, the nurses, all the medical staff in that procedure. We thank you for his faithfulness, the faithfulness of those who have been praying for him and praise you for such good and wonderful news and outcome. Lord, we also pray for your protection for so many people that that we will probably never meet, uh, people that today and the days before today and even the days following uh, will face the most tragic element of Super Bowl Sunday. Father, we pray for all those young girls, young children, the women, Uh, who will be trafficked, who will be taken away, uh, who will be led astray into dangerous situations in the midst and the chaos of the events of Super Bowl Sunday. Lord, we pray for their protection. We pray that uh, not a single person would be taken in such a way. We pray that not a single person would be defiled, would be brutally and, and woefully sinned against and assaulted in any way. Father, protect those people who need your protection, those who are most vulnerable, those who might be uh, avoiding the glimpses, the glances of those around them who might help them, who might love them, who might serve them, and instead are falling prey to wicked schemes and being led astray even by their own hearts at points. Lord, protect them and keep them safe. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in ways of announcements, uh, really not much new. Uh, We do have our board meeting next week. So, uh, again, uh, if you uh, have anything you'd like to add to that, contribute to that, or be in any way involved in that, please let us know. Uh, So, again, that's next week on Saturday. Uh, At this point, I'll turn it over to our worship team here. Uh, They'll do an instrumental for us, and we will uh, uh, sing another song before the message this morning after that. At the fall, the world went awry. It flipped off of its spiritual axis when Adam sinned. And not only did Adam fall and become cursed, so too did all of creation. Creation itself, the universe, if you will, suffered a curse when sin came into it, when sin entered into it. Consequently, we have this phenomenon where people are quite comfortable sinning. It's very interesting that mankind is rather comfortable in their sin, complacent. And the reason for that is simply this. If you put a cursed man in a cursed system, he's going to get along well in that system. It's when you apply righteousness into that system, when you apply truth into that system of lies, that you begin to make waves. That's why when the truth of God throughout all human history, has entered into our path, our journey, it has tended to turn people's worlds upside down. John 3.19, it says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. The human heart is naturally prone to love darkness, to love ignorance instead of truth, to love lies instead of truth. In other words, human beings love the system. They get along in this corrupt system because their deeds are evil, because from birth our hearts are prone to evil. And so when you have 
an evil man and an evil world, you have a sort of partnership there, a joining together. And there is, in a sense, uh, this situation where man is accommodated to his system through the curse. And the thing which really upsets this system is the application of righteousness, the introduction of truth into that system of error. Man has developed a system of sin, and that sin, as long as he continues to be sinful, to be a cursed creature, uh, he can accommodate that. He can be comfortable in that situation. He can go with the status quo. It is when a Christian comes along, a believer comes along, and speaks truth in such a way that provokes people to respond and lives a life of repentance, which uh, causes that system to sort of get flipped, for the world to be turned upside down. It's strange in this system of sin to have righteousness and truth. And throughout all of God's redemptive history, he has had dramatic and drastic means to really smash into man's system. And he has used miracles in particular ages. But as we've discussed before, if you look at scripture, people who do miracles are quite rare. For the vast majority of redemptive history that we see in Scripture, miracles are not taking place. So what does God use? Well, he primarily uses, and has always used, people. He uses individuals, he uses small groups, he occasionally uses large groups of people to make those changes, to bring truth and repentance into that system of sin and error. People are the vehicles that throw the system into chaos. Righteous people are running into an unrighteous system, and that creates waves. And in our chapter this morning, Acts chapter 17, we meet a few of these people who really have that sort of effect on the system. And we began talking about this last week, and we used verse 6 as sort of our launching point. And that continues to be our launching point. At the end of verse 6, the people in Thessalonica characterize Paul and Silas and Timothy with these words. They say, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. These men are flipping our system. They're challenging the status quo. That's the claim that's being made here. And in doing so, and in saying this about these men, they compliment them. They compliment Paul and Silas and Timothy for turning the world upside down. Because I think it's a noble and a righteous goal for the believer to want to have that kind of impact for the Lord. I don't think any of us wants to be somebody who's not remembered. I don't think any of us want to be somebody who has no positive impact for the gospel or for God in this world. But a lot of us struggle, myself included, struggle with how to be the kind of person that's like Paul and Silas, that makes those waves, that challenges this broken system we are born into. So that's why we're talking today about the characteristics and the qualities of Paul Silas and Timothy as these wave makers, as these people who turn the world upside down. And so as we look to this passage, I want to comment on those basic necessary characteristics of those kinds of people. Because again, if you're like me, you want to be a part of that. You want to be part of the team that God is using to change the world. And it's not just to change the world for change's sake, but it's primarily to bring glory to God. And subsequent to that, it's to love people. It's to bring them salvation, to usher them into this beautiful and wonderful thing that we've been given, that we've been blessed with. Because people who change the world were at some point involved in our lives. Because we are blessed to inherit that history of challenging the system of going against the status quo. So these people turn the world upside down because of five simple things that are illustrated in the text. And this isn't the absolute list. There's probably more that can be drawn out of this. There's certainly more that can be drawn out from other passages. But these are the five things that grabbed my attention from the text. And I hope the Lord will honor that as we examine these. We've already discussed two of them last week. The first was courage. 
And the second was content. So that is substance and truth. You need courage and you need truth, the message that is in line with nature, with reality, with God's will, and uh, as he created things, and in line with the gospel message that saves. The third thing that makes somebody who really changes the world is converts. It's seeing people come to Christ. That is an important part of Christian ministry. It goes from you making waves to others making waves because of the waves that God has made through you. It multiplies. I believe every Christian should see converts. That doesn't mean all of us have to be Billy Graham. Certainly, I mean, none of us in this room will have converts like Billy Graham. And so that's not the expectation. He's not the standard. But we are to be ministers of reconciliation. We are to be disciples who make disciples, multiplying the body. And we do so under the sovereign arm of God. That doesn't deny his hand in this. We plant or we water perhaps, but we always acknowledge that it is God who gives the growth. And if we are faithful in our efforts, we will see results. I'm confident of that. We'll either see results on this side of Christ's return or the next side of Christ's return. There's a promise given to the apostles. And I know it is given to the apostles, but I think it is also, it applies to us. In John 15, 16, Jesus said this. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, that it would remain so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus is talking about choosing the apostles for the purpose of sending them out to bear fruit. They're disciples who are to make disciples. That is always the standard that Jesus sets for them, to go and make disciples. And that standard continues for us today. And so converts are part of it. When you take a cursed and an unholy system and you multiply the number of holy people, you have a tremendous effect on that system to change the world. You can't do it alone. You have to be reproductive. And you know why Paul was so effective? It's not because he went into town and nobody believed him, but because he went into town with a whole bunch of people believing him. That's what messed up the system. And that's not unique to Paul. If we were to have the courage and the content that we discussed last week to go into these places and to preach the truth, there will be fruit. If we are faithful in that, there will be fruit. Because you're not going to do it alone. You're not going to have an effect on the world if you're just going at it alone. You have to affect other people in order to affect the world. And I believe that God intends for us to all bear fruit in this area. When Paul went into town, we can look at verse 4 in our text here. Uh, he did all this and he preached Christ and he hit the issue right in the head. Acts 17, verse 4. This is in Thessalonica. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. What we see here is terrific. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's something to praise the Lord about. We see here that there are there's a group of people, or a few groups of people, really, who come to believe. They respond with faith. They were persuaded. They were convinced. We talked about that last week, how Paul, when he went into Thessalonica, uh, really wrestled with these people intellectually. He stood there and he received questions and he had answers. And he looked to the scripture to prove to them that the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer and die according to God's will, according to prophecy, according to scripture. And so it was a very intellectual pursuit that's happening here. And through that intellectual pursuit, through giving these Jewish people a bit of wisdom, the Apostle Paul, through God, is able to affect some tremendous change there. People come to believe. They are convinced. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul gave an airtight defense of what had to happen with the Messiah. These people in Thessalonica were not necessarily searching for this truth, and yet the world was turned upside down by the truth as Paul presented it to them. 
in Berea, which we looked at also last week, the next town that Paul goes to, they were waiting to believe. They were eager to believe. They were ready for this. They were craving this. And all they needed to do was grab their Old Testament, grab their scriptures, and see if what Paul was saying was true. And when they did that, they found that it was. He presented the scripture. He fed into their hearts, into their desires, the word of God, and they responded positively to that. I think it's pretty interesting how in evangelism you run into these two kinds of people. Sometimes you'll meet the guy who doesn't even seem like he's open, and yet you'll present Jesus Christ, and you'll sort of give him the argument for Jesus, give him the whole plan, and let him see how beautiful it is and how perfect it is, and the Spirit of God will bring that person to Christ. Somebody who wasn't looking for it, may not have seemed ready for it, and yet the Holy Spirit works a miracle in that person's life. And other times you get some person who's just sort of sitting there, and they're just ready for somebody to give them the truth, and they're hungry for that, they're longing for that, and they don't maybe even realize what they're longing for, but yet they receive that truth as it's planted into them. And Berea was that. Look at verses 10 through 12. This is in Berea. Now the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, without a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Now, as believers, we have to be ready for both of those situations, to know the word well enough that we can persuade those who may not yet be open to it, and also give that information to those who are diligent students who can verify it on their own. And the results here for the Apostle Paul were converts. It was believers. It was people responding positively to the gospel. Some were persuaded. Look at verse again, 4 again, where these people are persuaded. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. A few Jews believed, and a whole bunch of Gentiles believed. And more than a few of the chief women here, the leading women, there were some women who had some pretty important positions in the town, and they believed as well. And so we have here this tremendous beginning of a church here in this area in Thessalonica. There's this large numbers of Gentiles. There's a lot of women coming to this, and there's some Jews. And they were always the, more, the most difficult, it seemed, always the most unwilling to accept their own Messiah, the message that Christ is their Savior, the one they had been waiting for all this time. Paul reflected on the beginning of this church in Thessalonica. He was remembering their beginning when he wrote this in his first epistle to them. In 1 Thessalonians, he wrote, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Well, that's pretty pretty quick, what's happening here. That's a, a pretty uh, sort of speedy turnover here, of what's happening here. They'd just been saved for a little while, and yet the whole place, the whole land and area knows about them, has heard of their works. Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians 8, he says, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. Do you know that the reputation of that little church just sort of splattered all over the world? It, it poured over into the world around them. The word through Thessalonica went like wildfire. They were sitting right on the Ignatia Highway. We talked about that last week. And everybody that went through that town, that city, that sort of capital of Macedonia, they knew what was going on. It's exciting to see what happens to that group as you look into the epistles written to them in Thessalonica. And yet you never hear another word about Berea. You hear about it a little bit here. You get another historical clue from before this time. 
But other than that, you don't hear about Berea. You don't hear about this small town. You don't hear about these people who are more noble than those in Thessalonica, which became really the most beloved church that Paul ever wrote to. You can read Corinthians and you can sense Paul's frustration with the church in Corinth. You can sense just how difficult it is for him to try and manage them from afar and, and shepherd them from afar. And you can read sort of the opposite of that when he writes at Thessalonica. These are people who he truly, he truly loved, just as he loved those in Corinth. But there's something different about them. They don't need the correction that the believers in Corinth do. They are culturally different in their outworking of their faith. He loved these people. And all the churches that are written to in the New Testament, that church seems to be the one that is most like how Christ wanted the church to be. They're the most Christ-like church. Berea, they were noble in their pursuit of scriptural proof. But when you get saved, you, you never hear, they get saved, you never really hear anything else about them. That doesn't mean they were a bad church. It certainly doesn't mean that. Uh, it's likely that as Paul writes Thessalonians, Berea is close enough to there that he would be including them and, and expecting them to receive that letter as well. But you don't directly hear about them. Thessalonica had been persuaded. They weren't so noble, but they had been persuaded. And when they got saved, they went wild. They became what God wanted the church to be. And you might say, well, what is that supposed to prove? What does that mean? It is to prove that salvation is an equalizer. It doesn't matter what you were before you were saved. At the moment of salvation, it becomes an issue of what you do with the resources that become yours. Those infinite resources of the Holy Spirit's power, of God's blessings, of being in line with God's will, the ability to pray to your Father and find comfort and guidance from Him. Notice also that in both places, Paul used Scripture. If there are ever to be waves, they're going to be when we use the Word of God to win people to Jesus Christ. I believe the people who make the world different for the sake of the gospel are the people who multiply holiness in the world. And the only way you can multiply holiness in the world is to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. That creates waves. That flips the world upside down. But how do we do this? Because it's a lot easier said than done for so many people, myself included. It's difficult. So how do we do this? How can we be the kind of people who share Christ like they did in Thessalonica, like Paul did? First, we recognize our obligation. That's an important thing to remember, that we have an obligation. We have a responsibility to do this. We have an obligation to share Christ. I think it's pretty selfish for us to accept Christ, to receive him, and then to begin making ourselves comfortable in Christ and content in Christ, at least content in terms of our mission and our calling. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go in the world and make disciples and teach them to observe the commandments like this commandment to make disciples. Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. These apostles that, that Jesus is speaking to are promised the Holy Spirit, and in response to that, they are to be witnesses. I don't think the calling is different for us in the body of Christ. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 2 Corinthians 5.20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We are ambassadors, representations of God, of the gospel, of the truth, of light, and God makes his appeal through us. Leaders of countries who establish ambassadors give them obligations. They have expectations. They go there as ambassadors to do, to do a job. And we shouldn't think any differently 
the fact that we are all, every single one of us, not just pastors, not just missionaries, we are all ambassadors for Christ. So we recognize our obligations. We feel compelled to do that. Secondly, we recognize that results are not always positive. And we take comfort in that. Some will say that evangelism gets easier the more you do it. And that, that might be true, but, but maybe it's not necessarily true. I, I don't know if I quite believe that. Because it seems like for some people, the more they do it, the more they're effective in preaching the gospel, the harder Satan is going to resist that. The world is going to resist that. And the closer we get to the coming of Christ, the harder men's hearts are going to be. I don't think it will necessarily get easier. I think for many it will get harder. And in that we find some comfort in, in disassociating ourselves from the results because it's ultimately not up to us. We plant and we water. And that's our responsibility. And that's our obligation. But God gives the growth and does so according to his will. But he can't give the growth. He won't give the growth if his ambassadors are not working, if we're not planting, if we're not watering. Thirdly, we recognize our power. That is the power of God that is bestowed on us. The Holy Spirit will do the convicting. The Holy Spirit will do the empowering. And so we've got so much power there that we don't need to worry about the negatives. We don't need to worry about them rejecting Christ. We recognize our obligation. We recognize that results are not always positive. We recognize our power. And last, we recognize his promise. John 15, 16. I read this earlier when Jesus said to his apostles, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. God has chosen us and he's promised us fruit if we are faithful to our calling. So that's his promise. We go and we'll bring forth fruit. So we have courage, we have content, we have converts, and that's affecting the world. And the fourth of our five things that we have is conflict. If you hit the world courageously with the right message and people get saved because of your faithfulness, there's going to be conflict. Well, why is that? It's because creating holiness in an unholy environment is going to cause conflict. You're making waves. That's part of what God wants you to do. We remember we talked about Paul's courage last week, how he always went to the synagogue first. And every time you went to the synagogue, every single time that you read it in the book of Acts, it is always followed by conflict. It is always followed by people pursuing him, wanting to hurt him, wanting to stop him, imprison him, or kill him. Every single time. But also what you see every single time is people coming to faith in the midst of that conflict. Or perhaps, I should say it this way, because people are coming to faith, there's conflict. Because he is faithful in his ministry, there's conflict there. In Thessalonica, they had conflict to come. Conflict was inevitable. Paul knew it was coming because... He was already gone by the time they came to get him. Verse 5, Acts 17, verse 5. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. These Jews were jealous. They're envious. So what are they jealous of? What is making them so envious? I think the most pressing thing that they envied was that Gentiles had been offered the Messiah on an equal basis with them. That was always their hang-up. They always had a difficult time with that. They were holding out for the singular quality of Judaism and of the Jews. And they were, they were really quite upset. And they decided that they had to do some, something. The system, it cannot tolerate holiness. This broken world does not tolerate holiness. And so they got a bunch of of dissipated and worthless sort of characters who sort of made a profession of lying about and looking for trouble. And they gathered these guys who hung around doing nothing in the marketplace, just waiting for trouble. And they got them to start this riot. They gathered a company and they set the city in an uproar. They knew that they were staying with Jason, who must have been a, a new Christian there. 
And so it says that they assaulted the house of Jason. Here comes the whole town, so to speak, and they're coming down to Jason's house, and they sought to bring out to the people Paul and Silas and Timothy. You know what? God was far ahead. Paul and Silas and Timothy were already gone. They're gone, but Jason, it being his home, he is still there. Verse 6, And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. They took Jason and these other Christians instead of Paul and Silas and Timothy, and they hauled them off to the rulers of the city, and they pressed them with two charges. They have to include Jason in this now because he's the only one they could really capture, him and a few other believers. And it starts at the end of verse 6 there where we've seen this charge before. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. The first charge is sort of general revolution. These guys are revolutionary. They're radicals. They're changing everything. They're, they're chopping at the roots of everything that is sacred here in Thessalonica. They're messing up our continuity. So they charge them with revolution. The second thing they charge them with is very specific. And it's very specific treason against Rome. Verse 7. And Jason has received them and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar. Saying that there is another king and that it's Jesus. They got the message loud and clear. It's about Jesus. You know that's the same thing they crucified Jesus for. They crucified him in part for claiming to be king. Remember Pilate asked him the question, are you a king? And the Jews later all cry out, no, he's not our king. We will have no king but Caesar. But the Jewish people who have been oppressed by Rome, who have resisted in part, some of them have resisted in part the rule of Caesar. Some have went along with it quite fine. All the crowd shouted, we have no king but Caesar. They bowed down to their pagan and foreign masters to crucify Jesus. It was the whole issue of Jesus and his kingship. And here Paul had been preaching the kingship of Jesus, and so they grabbed onto that. The same thing that the crowd used to execute Jesus, they were going again to use against Paul, or because he wasn't there, to use against Jason. They hate us. Because they hate Jesus. When you announce that Jesus has a dominant claim over the lives of men, which happens in announcing that Jesus is king, some people don't like to hear that. And so they decided that they would just take care of this group. Verse 8. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. So the whole city's in turmoil. But these rulers, they're actually pretty smooth guys. They're pretty cool, pretty intelligent. They act pretty wisely here. And I think God probably had something to do with this, but they are wise in their decision that we see in verse 9. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. They made Jason come up with a sort of bond to guarantee that Paul and Silas and Timothy wouldn't trouble them anymore. And so they had Jason on the spot. And they really had a guarantee against the good behavior and the quick exit of Paul and Silas and Timothy. And, you know, it's a pretty smart move. Well, they had to leave. Paul, Timothy, Silas, they had to go. And so they go to Berea in verse 10. And, you know, Paul reflected back in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 17. He says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. This whole setup with the security, this bond that was guaranteed by Jason, you know, and Jason did it for their sake, meant that they would never have a way to get back into the, the town, the city of Thessalonica, so long as these magistrates were there. It continues in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul continuing to talk about them. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. The conflict came. And that's a good thing. 
Conflict for the Christian is a good thing. It's a promised thing. Thessalonica became the best church that we see uh, a letter written to in the New Testament. And probably one of the reasons was that it existed in terrible persecution. Paul couldn't even get back there to see them. When he went to Berea, what happened there? You might say, well, certainly those noble guys wouldn't give him trouble. And you'd be right. But as we saw last week, uh, something amazing really happens here. They're pursued. Verse 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. So here comes this gang of people after Paul from up to 60 miles away, and they stir up trouble. And Paul had to leave again. And I think uh, just as really sort of a little bit of insight into Paul, I think this may have been the low point in his missionary life, at least up to this point. He had left Luke in Philippi. Now it says in verse 14, it says, Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Silas and Timothy remained there. Paul was sort of the ringleader here. He's, he leaves, but Saul or Silas and Timothy stay. Well, why do they do that? I think it's obvious. I think it's obvious to remember sort of Paul's pattern here. They stay to be disciple makers. They stay to disciple the people in Berea. Because that was always Paul's great concern for new believers. Not that, that they just be saved and done with, but that they be discipled, that they be helped in their transformation into Christ's likeness. And so he left Silas and Timothy there. He left Luke, he left Silas, he left Timothy. He's on his own. But as strong as Paul was, as we see him, and his strength throughout the scriptures here, as strong as he was, he was in an island. And I believe he's probably at this point hurting inside. And I believe he's a lonely man at this point because he's always had a companion. And he's hustled off to Athens. We see verse 15. Those who conducted Paul, Paul brought him. Sorry, those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, but after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. He sent back word. He said, tell Timothy, tell Silas, I need them down here. Verse 16 says something that you, that you never really read about Paul. Verse 16, now Paul waited. Now while Paul was waiting for them, you don't really see Paul doing much of that. He doesn't really wait around a lot. Some commenta commentators think that he was just going to wait there until they got there. He was so low. He's so hurting. And we see in that conflict. But out of that conflict comes joy. Out of that conflict came the productivity of these churches. The fifth thing, the fifth quality is concern. And I want to close with this. And I think this is the thing that has to be in our minds. And if, if we miss this, we miss everything. The last thing that made them people that changed the world was concern. And it wasn't just concern for the lost. That's not really it. That's not what Paul made Paul do what he did. Look at verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city full of idols as he saw that the city was full of idols. It wasn't just concern for the lost. He saw that God was not being glorified. And the greatest motive that any Christian could ever have is the motive of bringing glory to God. That's the overruling motive of all. When we bring people to Christ, that brings glory to God. When we love our neighbor, that brings glory to God. When we feed the hungry, that brings glory to God. When we repent of our sin, that brings glory to God. Paul says in Romans 1 verse 5, he says, I preach obedience to the Gentiles for the sake of his name. Paul saw that God was not being glorified and it tore him up. And he could have looked at all the, the beauties of Athens, that wonderful city. And that place was something else, the architecture and the art and the science. But a man named Peronius said, 
It was easier to find a god in Athens than it was a man. It was so given to idolatry. It was so given to the worship of these false gods. Paul didn't see the glory of Athens. He only saw he saw only the glory of God, and he saw God not being honored, and it tore him up, and it broke him down. And this is what made him, in part, this is what made him a man that changed the world. He was preoccupied with the glory of God. He saw every man, every woman as one who gave glory to God or one who didn't. And he knew God deserved it. And so there are the ingredients. When he saw a city given to idolatry, he disputed in the synagogue and with the devout persons and in the marketplace daily. He never stopped when he saw that God wasn't being glorified. It's all there. You can be somebody who affects the world. The pattern here is clear. But really, that's up to you. Let us pray. Father God, I ask that you guide us and bless us that you give us opportunities this day and the week to come to serve you, to serve amidst conflict, to have courage and to be bold, to share our faith with those around us, even when it's difficult, even when we know we might be rejected. Because we know if we do that ministry and we do it faithfully, we will be rejected because ultimately they reject Christ. This world that hates him is prone to that. And we should not fear that. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.